brother Chris did bees from uh, Australia, and then uh, today we're going to get Rancho Rizzo. So um, looking forward to that. So should I just okay. jump right in? Oh, yes, why? why don't we do it this way? Why don't you jump right in and then we'll just have a chat and we can ask you questions or whatever as we go. But also, Rizzo, can you start off by explaining biodynamic farming and gardening? Because I don't even think I fully understand it. Absolutely. Um, so biodynamics started in the um, late 20s when a gentleman, a um, Austrian philosopher named Rudolf Steiner, um, was asked by farmers in his area to help with some problems they noticed with their crops. Now this was um, immediately after World War I, immediately after the introduction of chemical um, fertilizers, chemical nitrogen, and all of the NPK that was to follow. And shortly thereafter, these farmers noticed a deterioration in their soil, in their crops, more pest problems. So they went to this respected um, philosopher. He's the gentleman who started Waldorf schools, if you're familiar with what those are. Um, and he gave a series of lectures. And so Steiner's lectures um, can be found in this book. This is the Agriculture courses by Rudolf Steiner and so it's a very very challenging read for a variety of reasons not only is it um, translated from you know that that German in 20s kind of language but it was written in the context of this philosophy of anthroposophy so there's a lot of esoteric and spiritual concepts that sometimes people get hung up on in biodynamics and so you can take what you want from it and leave what you don't want from it um, but this is a really really challenging read but um, it started in the 20s when he gave this series of lectures to farmers he reached out to other farmers and tried to present solutions to the problems that they were seeing so um, it's really the first organics. It's the, the parent of the organic movement, biodynamics. And nowadays people would call it morganic because organics, the standard, you know, the USDA in the United States owns the rights to the word organic. And there's been a loosening and loosening of standards of what that actually means. And what biodynamics really strives to do is to treat either a farm as a whole unit or a garden as a whole unit there are a lot of permaculture concepts involved so that um, fertility is created in the farm by crop rotation, by animal manures, by composting. Um, and there's a lot of attention paid to the microbes in the soil, um, the stars, people and animals and plants and the connection of all these things and it's ever-changing depending on the seasons and the year and so because it's always moving always changing that's where the term biodynamic has come from it's an ever-changing concept trying to treat the farm the garden as a living entity as a holistic place seeking to create the most nutritive food you can and to go into some of the more esoteric principles, they really, in addition for our own health, Steiner felt that for a person to reach certain levels of spirituality, that they need to have food of certain nutritive qualities that you could almost say that the karma that the farmer and the animals experience goes into the food and goes into this person, that everything is connected. So there's a lot of esoteric and there are a lot of very practical concepts. So that's the origins of uh, um, biodynamics. And it's out of Steiner's lectures in the 20s. And there are a lot of protégés and I'm going to call them rock stars, the biodynamic movement. Um, one of them is a gentleman named Aaron Fried Pfeiffer. He was a student of um, Steiner's. And Pfeiffer 
was sent to be like a, a soil microbiologist. He studied in a lot of universities, soil microbiology. He was the head of like Oakland's composting in the 40s, but he's written a bunch of very practical gardening books. This is one of them. It is not esoteric. It doesn't talk about spirituality and um, you know how our intentions are imparted in the food and the animals and the soils. It's really a practical how-to gardening guide. And um, he does talk about sowing um, and harvesting relative to moon cycles and times of the year. But it's really about growing maximum amounts of food, quality, nutritive, making compost. So Aaron Fried Pfeiffer. Um, what's that? That's a book called um, Grow a Garden and Be Self-Sufficient. And this is a book by Pfeiffer. So a lot of the practices that are, I'm going to call them almost trademark protocols in biodynamics involve compost and um, different activities that create microbiology. So let's talk about compost briefly. Compost is a fermentation. And in the same way that, you know, when you make kombucha, you have a SCOBY. And a good SCOBY has a certain, you know, it's a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeasts. And it sets the fermentation of the sugars in a particular direction such that you have a quality kombucha afterwards. The same is true when you're making compost. And so in Steiner's book, he gave a series of preparations. They call them like biodynamic preparation number 500, 501, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. He had a series of medical preparations. So the, the agriculture one started in 500. And by putting these preparations of composted um, dairy cow manure and yarrow and chamomile and oak bark and valerian, all of them composted in particular ways with unique sheaths. So um, for example, the chamomile is put in a bovine intestine and composted a certain way. The organic dairy cow manure is put in a cow horn and buried over the winter. But you take these composted materials, you put them in your compost pile, and that's like that SCOBY for compost that sets the fermentation in a particular direction that hopefully if you've made your compost pile well, the end product will be of maximum nutritive value. So because it's hard for a lot of people to compost the dandelion or the chamomile or the yarrow, the oak bark, all these products in the particular ways, Pfeiffer made that available to like your backyard gardener and, fi and farmer. So these are Pfeiffer's compost starter. And it has these ingredients that we talked, that I just talked about in it. You can order this from a number of, of sources. The Josephine Porter Institute of Applied Biodynamics is one of the places you can order this. And you, it comes as a dry bacteria uh, or powder form. It has uh, fun, fungi, enzymes, and bacteria. And you mix it with rainwater. You let it sit for 12 to 24 hours and you mix it into your compost and it kind of sets that composting in that direction. So they have not only a compost starter, but they also have a field spray. And also from um, the Josephine Porter Biodynamic Institute, you can get each of the individual preparations. And this is the 500 or horn manure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about 500 and horn manure because cows are integrally mixed into biodynamics. The cow is in the same way in the Hindu religion, the pinnacle of holy animals, cow manure, you know, that connection to the plants and the animals, um, the cow, the organic lactating cow. Um, female cow produces the most nutritive of all manures. 
So they sent, you know, different samples of manures, chicken manure and, uh, you know, bat guano and worm castings and organic dairy cow manure into labs. You know, this has been done many times to look at the nutri do nutritive analysis of these things. Well, it turns out the lactating dairy cow, if she's on pasture, on organic green pastures, if she's eating that diet that you would imagine a cow to be eating, her dung, um, you know, because she's producing milk for her young because she has that bovine four chambered stomach and she chews her cud. The bioavailability, the enzymes that are in her digestive tract, in her intestinal biome, her dung has the highest nutritive quality. So um, using that in compost gives you a high nutritive quality result. But one of the practices to create this 500 or horn manure and again to people who haven't really learned the biology and i'm kind of new of it it sounds very hocus pocus and weird and esoteric but in the fall you will pack a cow horn full of that manure and you will bury it with the opening side down and you'll leave it over the winter months in the earth and come springtime you dig that cow horn out and the manure has composted such that it has been infused with a lot of enzymes and bacteria and fungi that when you mix a, mix a teaspoon or two of that now we call it the 500 or the horn manure into rainwater or well water not tap water because of the chemicals that might kill some of the microbiology and you stir this in the water in uh, five gallons of lukewarm water and you do it in a, a very specific pattern you'll stir the water to get a vortex one way and then you change directions and in that changing of directions you create what we would call chaos until you get a vortex and then you change patterns again with that chaos into another vortex and you repeat this stirring pattern for an hour. And you actually, the viscosity of the water actually changes. You impart a lot of, and you know, in reading a particular book called The Alchemy of Biodynamics, it talks about the strata of water and how they rub together against each other and the microheating of the bubbles when you create them in the water, that this pattern basically infuses or enriches the water with this microbial life and you take it and you spritz it around your garden or farm or property in the evening hours and in the evening hours as the earth is cooling you know the earth is drawing in you know when things are heating up there's this levity but there's this coagula in the evening as everything's cooling and you're basically inoculating your soil with all this microbial life. And this is one of the hallmark processes of biodynamics is um, spritzing your land with this 500 and you're basically um, inoculating the land with this microbial life. So again, we're, ta we're talking now about microbes, right? So uh, biodynamics pays attention to my microbes and it pays attention to the stars and the moon phases and all of that. So I'm going to switch yeah, gear. Mike, yeah. Mike, so I put, I remember when I did my first compost, I got it from you, the starter. Yeah. And I used, and you gave me, first, it went nuts. It went crazy. Like, okay. It, it just, it was unbelievable. Uh huh. Uh, I was, in general. Right. Uh, and Go on. Good I'm listening. Um, Okay. And I stuck a branch in it and you said flick it all over the garden. Right. Is that, is that what you're talking about with the 500? You've sort of flicked all over the garden with a branch? Right. Well, you know, you can do that with this field spray. You can do it with the compost yeah. starter. Both the compost starter and the field spray have this 500 as one of the ingredients in it. But these also, okay. but these also have other ingredients. For example, the compost starter, Aaron Fried Pfeiffer, went to like twenty-something different farms, and they took soil samples. Again, he was a soil microbiologist, 
and he found the specific enzymes, fungi, and bacteria that were associated with humic soil, colloidal humic soil, healthy soil that grew good crops. They isolated these fungi, bacteria, and enzymes, and they propagate them over at Josephine Porter Institute, as well as this valerian and the yarrow and the dandelion and the oak bark and these other ingredients that I talked about that, as I related it to a SCOBY, sets the fermentation of the compost in a particular direction. So all of these have a slightly different purpose, but they all um, really relate back to microbial life and putting healthy fungi, enzymes, or bacteria into your soil. So yeah, you use the compost starter, you can spritz it around, you can put it in your compost. Um, and the same is true with the 500 or the horn manure, the same is true with the field spray, each having a slightly different um, ingredient profile in them. And going forward about 500 steps, all of this eventually gets into your gut, right? Which will create your immune system. Well, so system. right, what we're trying to do here is create healthy soil, and healthy soil creates um, healthy foods, they're more pest resistant, um, higher nutritive quality. I got competition with my goat here right now. Um, <laughs> this one's a Charlotte, so I'm gonna have to guard my books now. Game on. Um, and yeah, you know, again, it's healthy crops, it's healthy soil, it's a healthy farm, and you know, the the real heavyweights of biodynamics would say, and if you get all of that, you'll also be able to be more in tune with um, the spiritual world. Um, you know, you, you're, there's a lot. There's a lot to it. You know, your connection to the animals, your connection to the earth, your ability to see things that some people <coughs> just don't connect to. You have to really feed your body. You have to feed your soul. You know, I don't. I don't eat uh, meat. You know, and you don't want to use, for example, confined animal feed lot manure in your compost. In biodynamics, what they would say is that that animal has suffered, that you will impart that suffering into your compost. This is all connected, that that suffering will be put into your garden or your farm, that that suffering will ultimately end up in your food. What you really want to do, part of the reason that the cow is so revered is not just, I kind of touched on the easier to quantify biology of the manure, but there's also a spiritual aspect of the cow. If you really think about a cow's demeanor, they're very serene. You know, they're holy in much of the world. Um, the cow horn that's used to put the manure in and bury, um, in biodynamics they would not only say there's a certain shape to it, there's a certain you know, like it's like a cartilage material. There's a certain permeability to it. But in many ways, and again, this is getting pretty esoteric, it's almost like an antenna, they would say, into the heavens. The way the hoofs of the cow are shaped and its connectedness to earth, and the way its horns are shaped and pointed, that there's, you know, these are all kind of connected elements. So yeah, you do, we're trying to create better, we're trying to create better soil, we're trying to create better food, we're trying to create, better us and it's all connected so that's some microbiology um one of the another rock star of the biodynamic movement is this woman named maria thun and maria she's famous in biodynamics and this is kind of like pfeiffer's um they were contemporaries it's a very practical growing guide but she did studies in her greenhouses that were related to germination rates, growth rates, when things flower, um, and their relationship to astronomy and astrology. So now we're kind of moving into the, the heavens and the stars and the connectedness that it has on our um, garden and farms. And this becomes a little esoteric again, but the way I describe it to people, and I know nothing about Zodiac, I'm totally a rookie in this department, but having lived a beach lifestyle, I understand the tides, right? I understand that moon phases, in new moons and full moons, that there's an obvious, evident, 
tangible, measurable movement of the ocean, right? And so it is in biodynamics. They say in certain moon phases, um, in the waxing gibbous or crescent phase, maybe there's um, a, a draw downward and it's better for root growth. And in full moons or in certain moon phases, it's better for flower growth. Um, you know, that's the, the top of the, of the crop that you usually the flowers. So depending on moon phases, and so there's a whole calendar, maybe as we move through this, I'll walk into my shed, that, that based on Maria Thun's studies, um, you know, where she basically did statistical analyses of if I sow seeds during certain periods of time, um, you know, what will the end result be? And where will I get my maximum? So you're trying to work in conjunction with the forces of astronomy. And so, again, there's a biodynamic calendar. Certain days are considered flower days, best for working for flat with flowers. Root days, planting or sowing root crops, carrots, beets, radishes, or germinating seeds. Um, you know, and, and so leaf days, same thing. All these parts of the plants, they say in biodynamics and based on her studies, have different um, you'll, you'll get better outcomes if you work with the plants on these particular days. I think it was the Romans who knew not to harvest logs during full moons because they retained water and they were more likely to rot. So different cultures have seen, you know, I think even in Chinese agriculture, there's a lot of close attention. In, in a lot of agriculture, in, in, in Native American agriculture, moon phases, people paid attention to that for sowing and harvesting their crops. And that is also the case in biodynamic in agriculture. Tropics, Say again? In the, tropics, they don't make those, in the tropics, they don't make those thatch huts unless it's a full moon, because it draws out the water and the, and, the, and the roof will be dry. Whereas if they cut the, if they cut the, thatch, the thatchings in, a, in a, a new moon or no moon, it, it, they're wet and they get fungusy roofs. That's what a guy told me in Costa Rica. Right. So, you know, other cultures have independently discovered a lot of these in modern agriculture where a lot of times a guy will be or a woman in a, in a tractor drinking a beer with their headphones, you know, tending to hundreds of acres a day. Sometimes we lose that touch and, you know, especially in monocultures. But, you know, back a long time ago, a hundred years ago, People were deeply in touch with their land and their animals or on small scale farms where, you know, you're really hands on. But Mike, this goes back to a lot of the, the, the agriculture became taking from the land. Where whatever you take, you're gonna put back in. So right. this whole regeneration process was stopped because of just worrying about the return they got from the land and what they can take out of it. Right. Rather than the whole life cycle of putting back in. If you take a crop out, you've got to put you gotta put something back into that soil to get it back for what I gave you. Absolutely. So again, these two books, which are I'm gonna call them really not very esoteric, very practical growing guides. They talk about, for example, growing your nitrogen fixtures, you know, your fava beans, your pole beans, you know, those are really well known to be fixing, or flowers like snapdragons, put nitrogen into the soil. And then you can follow that crop, crop rotation, with the heavy feeders, the corns or tomatoes that are takers from the soil. That's not a bad thing, or givers, or kind of more neutral. So crop rotation, um, compost making, manuring, um, all of those aspects are all about fertility and, um, you know, creating humus, a humic soil on your, in your garden or farm. I'm going to talk about one more of the rock stars of biodynamics. This guy's name is Alan Chadwick. And Alan Chadwick, there are a couple of books that are basically his lectures. Chadwick um, was also a student of Steiner's. And Chadwick went to um, a lot of, he's an English gentleman. He went to a lot of the best horticultural schools uh, in Europe. And eventually he came to UC Santa Cruz during the summer, summer of love in the 60s. And he turned a couple acre hillside at UC Santa Cruz into a modern day Garden of Eden. 
and you know the Bay Area being kind of a countercultural flashpoint in the in '67. Well, Chadwick, and he was a Shakespearean actor, so he, he's very flamboyant. His his language, he uses a lot of made-up words that are highly descriptive and beautiful. But basically, he he's a classically trained horticulturist, and he didn't use some of Steiner's like you know biodynamic preparation 500 or these yarrows, dandelions, oak barks, valerians. These comp these he traveled his own path he called it french bio-intensive gardening but he was born out of biodynamics he's one of the rock stars of the biodynamic world he's a great read he has lectures on everything from bees um which you know chris i that was probably one of the best lectures i read um in here it was, i was just mesmerized by the flight of the queen and all the drones that chase her into the sun to mate with her and i mean just the poetry with which he describes the way the hive works absolutely how could this amazing lecture of strawberries compare to the you know to the bees but he has a lot of great lectures on classical um horticulture and um you know King Louis, all the French classical gardens. So there are a lot of different subjects his lectures cover. Great read, another one of the rock stars of the biodynamic movement. So that kind of touches on the foundation of biodynamics. Um, Pfeiffer and his kind of microbiology, Maria Thun and her studies of how stars and moon phases influence our plants, and Chadwick, who's kind of a a 60s flower child, you know, travel his own path fertility guy. Um, and you know, I was fortunate to have a mentor. I volunteered at a farm for a couple years in Malibu. His name was Jack McAndrew. He's about 85 now. And he studied with Chadwick. He studied with some of the other rock stars of the biodynamic movement. And so he mentored me and I'm still friendly with him for the last couple of years. And so, I'm channeling my inner Jack right now, and I should have started this whole speech with, I'm totally underqualified. I have, you know, to, to speak about all this. I don't have, you know, any kind of classical background. I'm kind of a gardener hack at best on a small little garden behind me. But I did have the privilege of studying with Jack, who is an unbelievable biodynamic farmer, a legend out here. Um, and so I'm kind of imparting what, what I was able to glean from him over the last couple of years. So let's see, I think I had a, yeah, yeah, fire away. Mike, do you reckon uh, they're going to get hijacked like organics did? Because a lot of wineries and everyone are claiming they're biodynamic now and you just wonder which way it's going to hit with that. Okay, so good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, originally, the anthroposophists didn't drink alcohol. So there currently there are a couple of, just like the USDA certifies organic, there are a couple of organizations that certify biodynamic. Demeter is probably the big one. And Demeter is named after the Greek god of fertility. And they used to not certify wineries, but in the same way that organics has been a big marketing tool, and rightfully so for um, food growers, um, biodynamics has become very popular in wineries. And because there's money to be made certifying people, um, Demeter a couple years ago started certifying wineries. And as I explained earlier, one of the hallmark philosophies of biodynamics is to treat a farm diversity is integral in a biodynamic farm a diverse crops diverse animals and a winery in many ways is a monoculture right it's a monocrop so it doesn't fit the profile of um, a typical turn of the century farm which is what you would think of when you think of biodynamics but again there's money in it and so Demeter does certify wineries and they probably just have to run through some token practices. They probably spritz the 500 around their field. Um, you know, the valerian 
juice, the juice of valerian flower actually warms your plants up by a couple of degrees. So farmers that have frost intolerant crops, when you're about to be borderline frost, this is just in common agriculture, they'll spray valerian. So, uh, you know, I'm sure that these wineries practice a few cornerstone practices to get the certification because it's marketing. Um, and then others probably really take it very seriously and maybe between their rows of um, vines, they're planting cover crops, they're planting nitrogen fixers. Um, so, you know, maybe they're letting animals graze in the off season between their, their um, vines. So I'm sure there's a spectrum of practices, but wines are, wineries are typically in to a large degree monocultures. And so it's not your typical biodynamic um, model. But yeah, they're popular. A lot of them are doing, a lot of them are using the 500 uh, for the fertilizing. And then the other one they're doing is having animals graze underneath between the seasons, like you said, sheep, right. goats, those sorts of things, just to tidy up their weeds and stuff like that. Right. And then there's not a great deal of diversity. And then their manures obviously um, are good for the farm. So, yeah, that's how um, wineries got into um, the biodynamic um, business. But it's a business. Yeah, and they're starting to use a lot of the of the the great leaves instead of binning them now they're putting them back under the crop okay so yeah a lot of composting up the right you know i mean a lot of times you know you, you import fertility you import um compost manures nitrogens and if you can plant cover crops on the off season if you can have animals grazing and putting their manure there then that's fertility from the farm and so that would be a way that wineries um, try and practice biodynamic protocols. So that's kind of uh, the, the quick version of, of what I've been, I've, you know, of biodynamics and what I've learned about it. Well, Mike, uh, why don't you, uh, I don't know what else you have. You want me to, the, uh, want me to walk stuff? through the garden? I'll walk into my shed. I'll show a few things going on. Yeah, go for it. Okay, let's do that.